this quote here. It says, wisdom literature doesn't teach a universally valid truth. Okay? I know when you hear that, you instinctively go like, so are you saying that there's times where it's wrong? Okay. I'll just I'll quote a single like, little couplet of verses to you to prove my point. Reprove a fool according to his folly, lest to become wise in his, own, in his own conceit. Reprove not a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Like, the fact that those two verses are back to back, and one says reprove a fool, the other says reprove not a fool, shows you that there's a little bit of flex, there's a little bit of context that you need to understand. There's a little bit of like, hey, do you... Don't, don't just run out and push button A and expect the result. Like, there's, there's more to it. What Proverbs are trying to do is they're trying to take a generally accepted truth, like a general truth that you need to understand, and they're giving you the general idea of when it's true. So, like, you generally, if you do this, you will receive this reward. Okay? That's important to understand because as we go through the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon is is struggling with this. He's he's kind of internally trying to process what he's what he's seeing in the world around him. So one of the things he'll see is like the race is not always to the strong or the, the, to the swift. And he's like, why is that the case? You know, or or there's a wise man who delivers an entire city by his wisdom, yet they forget his name. Why? You know, or, or there's a guy who he spends all of his life, you know, and he, he gains everything that you could possibly desire, but at the end of his life, he's like, I'm miserable. Why? Like, that doesn't seem, like, that doesn't seem to match up with reality or doesn't seem to match up with anything that would, like, even conventional wisdom would tell you. And so he's, he's kind of combining a, this is how you should live, but you do have to understand that God's still in charge, so God can still do things and these might seem to be at, at odds, okay? So wisdom literature, again, it's a general truth, all right? Um, so there are times where you think you may have done everything right, and you, you may still not get the end that that proverb promised, because God has other plans, okay? Uh, it's also understanding this idea. Uh, it's, it's tackling the messy truth that some proverbs don't seem to be true, okay? So the, the wording there is careful, Okay, the proverb is still true, but again, it, it's a proverb. It's, it's meant to be taking this really, really vast truth, boil it down into something that's memorable and, and probably a little bit pithy, and, and, and now you can remember it. But again, there's, there's more to it than just that. Okay, uh, also wisdom literature can be proverbial, which means it's summing up truths in ways that are quite often true. Okay, so that, this is just what I want you to kind of understand. As we go through the, we're not going to spend a lot of time in the book of Proverbs, but what Proverbs does is it just kind of presents things black and white. Ecclesiastes comes along and, and Solomon is showing you, okay, there's a little bit more to it, there's a little bit more, let, let's expand this out. And then the book of Job is a really, really good example of something where it's like, okay, here's a guy who is living unbelievably well. Like he is living as righteous as you could live, to the point where God's like, yeah, he's perfect. And look at all the stuff that happens to him. And Job is kind of like a narrative tackling of this problem. So, so you take Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job, you put them all together, and you kind of get the complete picture of how God works. And what Job is cool is it kind of opens the back door and shows you the dialogue behind the scenes. So you're like, oh, there's actually a, a discussion going on. Okay, Proverbs is like, after it's filtered through like 24 things, it comes out and it's like, boop. You know, and so Job's friends, they were the Proverbs livers. That's as far as they went. They were like, yay, we live by Proverbs. And Job is stepping back going, this isn't making any sense. And then the book of Job steps back even farther and says, let's see the whole picture. And so that, that, that's kind of how this works, if, that's, if that makes sense. All right, so Ecclesiastes is going to show us that wisdom, okay, Wisdom is a good way to, quote-unquote, hedge your bets, okay? So, so Solomon will say, like, money is a defense, and wisdom is a defense. But the good thing about wisdom is, is it gives life to those that have it. And so he's saying, like, hey, you can diversify your po portfolio, so to speak. So you can go invest in money and wisdom and this and this and this. But I'm just telling you, the best thing to invest in for a good life is wisdom. And that's, that's kind of where he's going. So... So there you go. But he understands this idea that God can do 
whatever he wants to do. Okay, and that's the idea of God's sovereignty. So always God is going to say, like, I will keep my promises, and I will, I, will, I will act in a certain way that's in accordance with my character. That is my sovereignty. I, I will act in a way that is in line with the way I've set out to act. So there we go. But God can do whatever he wants. All right? Now, as we go into this, um, again, our modern-day poetry in English is, is very different than Hebrew poetry. Modern day English poetry, uh, unless you're doing that terrible free verse stuff. Um, uh, anyway, um, but most poetry rhymes, okay? So the, the end line kind of has a repeating beat to it. Hebrew poetry is actually very, very different. What, what Hebrew poetry is trying to do is <clears throat> it is trying to repeat a common theme. Like, so it, it'll say something and then it'll repeat it again and then it'll repeat it again. I, I did this this morning with my voice. Um, the back window of our van broke out, and so I had to cover it in plastic, and I know the boys are going to play with it. So I put the boys in the car, and I said, don't touch the plastic, keep your hands off of it, I don't want you to be poking it. So like, I said the same thing three times, and the reason is, they don't listen, and so I figured if I can say it three different ways, one of those ways will sink in. So they might not understand by what I mean when I say don't poke it, but they might understand keep your hands off it. If they don't understand that, they might understand don't touch it. So I've said it three different ways so that they couldn't be like, well, I didn't poke it. I took my whole hand and just did this. And it's like, well, don't touch it. Well, I accidentally like lost my balance and leaned up against the window. So, so by covering it three different ways, I have explained it as fully as I can. But I've also removed any doubt there is about what, what was actually meant. Uh, a perfect example of this is Psalm 24. Uh, Psalm 24 uh, talks this. It says, a Psalm of David... The earth is the Lord, and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. So you see, the earth is the Lord's, the world. That's, that's Hebrew poetry. So the earth is the Lord's, and the world. And then the second phrase, the fullness thereof, they that dwell therein. And so he's it, it, it's playing on it. Verse 2, for he hath founded it upon the seas, he has established it upon the floods. He's repeating himself. All right. He goes back, he says, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? Again, it's, it's poetry. It's just repeating the same thing twice, giving you a slightly different take on the same topic. He, hath, he that hath clean hands and a pure heart. He that hath not lifted up his soul to vanity or dealt deceitfully. Okay? And so with Hebrew poetry, sometimes you can have the same thing repeated twice. Sometimes it's a topic and then it'll contrast it right away. And, and so, as you, specifically as you read the Psalms, they're, they're really good at this. Uh, but there'll be times where you're like, I don't understand what that phrase means. Look at the next phrase. It'll normally clarify, and you're like, oh, okay, it's either a contrasting one, or it's kind of pushing the same idea along. Uh, keep going with Psalm 24. It says, uh, verse 5, He shall receive a blessing from the Lord, the righteousness, of God, the righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. Uh, lift up your heads, O you gate, and be ye lift up your everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gate, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. And so that, that, that whole thing, I didn't read it, like, I didn't repeat myself. That literally was the same phrase being used twice because it's, it's musical. Um, and so this is what we're going to see as we go through the book of Ecclesiastes, is there are times where he's going to repeat himself over and over and over. And the whole point, part of it is Hebrew poetry. But the other thing is he's trying to, to push this idea that there, is, there are these little truths that you just need to grasp. All right? Uh, like I said, Psalm 24 is a great example. Uh, and this is, this is what we call parallelism. All right? Now, as this is, uh, I just want to give you a few parallelisms parallelisms, uh, to keep your eyes out for. Uh, the first one is what we call synonymous. Uh, it basically is what I just read. The same thought just being repeated over and over and over again. Okay? Uh, parents do this one all the time. All right? You also have antithetic, which just basically means opposite, like the opposite idea. All right? And it's groups that express contrasting thoughts. If you read the Proverbs, they, they get into this a ton. Okay? So they will they'll, they'll present an idea and then immediately present the opposite. And so if you're ever confused in the Proverbs, a lot of times it's really good to look for the one you understand, and that will explain the one you don't. And if they're joined with a word like but or however, or so, you, you know it's an antithetical one. 
you, you know it's opposite, okay? But if it's joined with an and or something like that, you know it's probably more on the synonymous level, okay? Uh, I'm, I know it's a little technical, but it'll help you understand this. Synthetic, um, this, this is similar to the synonymous. The synthetic one, it just kind of takes the idea and it's like, let's take it to the next level. Okay, now let's take it to the next level, okay? So they're, they're very similar. It, I'm sure there is a technical distinction between the two of them. Um, but this one is, is going to be more of just a general, like, okay, you just said the same thing twice. This is going to be like the, ooh, ooh, you, you took that, ooh, that, that's kind of cool. Like, you just keep going more and more with it, okay? And so these are some of the types of things you're going to see. Um, and then this, this one, I think more things are emblematic for me than should be uh, because that's how I interpret some things where I'm like, I, I have no idea what that's talking about. Oh, I know what that's talking about. Ah. Uh, and, and so, but there is, there is one that is emblematic, which is, they say a more general statement, and then as they continue, it starts shedding more and more light on the previous things that were said. Or, or you can even see this between verses, all right? And so these are just some examples of some Hebrew poetry. Um, and then again, the climatic one, uh, we just saw a little bit of it in the, in the psalm I just read, but this idea where it just keeps repeating the same phrase over and over and over, and you're just like, okay, and, and I forget which one it is. There's, there's one psalm which repeats the same phrase like five or six times. I mean, it's just... It, it really sounds like a chorus in a song where it just keeps coming back to this theme. And it's this idea of climatic where it just keeps repeating the same that thing. Forever, is that the one? Probably. Yeah, I, that, that might be the one. Um, but it just keeps, and you're like, okay, okay, I get it, I get it, I get it. And then you're like, okay, that was, that was cool. That was, that was good. And there's a reason why the book of the Psalms has been turned into such music. I mean, it's, it was the hymn book of, of Hebrews. Um, and, and so there are these parts that are repetitive and, and rhythmic, and it's just, I think it's really cool. Okay? You're also going to see a lot of wordplay. Um, there is, uh, the, the, my favorite one is, is Nabal. Uh, his, his word basically means fool, uh, but it has more to do with, like, emptiness, vanity, etc. And uh, you'll see this wordplay when David runs into Abigail. She's married to this guy, Nab Nabal, Nabal. And, uh, and he is just like an arrogant jerk who's proud and stubborn and all of this. And, and his wife, Abigail, says, like, is he not appropriately named Nabal? And, and, it's, and I don't believe that the actual, like, his word and the word are the exact same word, but it's close enough that it's a word play, you know? And so the, it, it's kind of a pun. And you'll, you'll see those throughout where there's, there's times in the Bible where they'll, they'll, they'll play off of these puns. There's a lot of times we miss it because we don't speak the Hebrew, but they'll, I mean, even a lot of the place names that are named after God, it's like, oh, this is the place where God sees me. And so they named it, God sees me. And you're like, well, that's creative. Well, I know, but, you know, when we're speaking in English and it's like, Jehovah Roy, it's like, oh, okay, sure. What does that mean? What well, means God sees me? Oh, because that, that, that was the place where God saw you. Yeah, like, Exactly. You know, it's like naming a place battlefield. What happened here? A battle. There you go. You know, and, and that's, that's kind of this idea. And so there'll be people who are named, and like, as you start looking at the name of the people, you're like, that's kind of their character. You know, it's so like Nabal, he's, he's vain and stupid and empty. You know, and then you see various characters. Uh, I like this in the beginning of Ruth, I believe. Uh, like Orpha and, and some of these character names like actually fit with who the character is. Um, so I don't know how that worked. I don't know if their parent, like, oh, it's so cute. You're going to be indecisive someday, so I'm going to call you Orpha. And then she became indecisive. I, I don't know. Um, but, but you're going to see a lot of wordplay. Um, again, this is uh, Nabal, the idea of foolish and wicked. It shares the same root connection with foolish or senseless, and so, so that's, that's how that plays. Um, you also have this thing called a chiasm. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because I want to get to the point. Uh, but chiasm, this is something that you can see all over Hebrew literature. You'll also see it in a lot of other languages, too. So you, it, basically, here's, did you guys ever do, like, poetry stuff? Like, iambic pentameter, and, like, it was, like, A, B, A, B, B, C, B, C, C, D. You know, and you had to mark out the stupid, like, rhyme scheme and all that. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to do that with a chiasm so you can kind of understand. And so there are times where a single verse will have this. Uh, there's times where it will be, like, a whole chapter. There's sometimes an entire book will we'll follow this pattern. And what it is, is it is a repetition of themes. So it's a progression of facts. So for instance, uh, here it is. You have a statement, and then you have another statement, and then another statement, and then another statement. Then suddenly you see a repetition of this, 
and then a repetition of that, and then a repetition of that, and then it goes all the way back to the first point. And, and you'll see that sometimes spread out over a whole book where it's like, and you have this guy who goes down to Egypt, and he gets married, and he has a kid, and then the kid dies. And then, and then like, suddenly something reverses, and now out of death, there's another marriage, and there's a kid, and they leave Egypt, and they come back to, and you're like, oh, so that whole story just kind of did a giant loop and came back to where it began. Uh, and so you'll see that in the book of Ruth and other places. I really like the Bible Project. Um, it's a, a YouTube channel, and they, they do kind of illustrated explanations of all these books of the Bible. And they will actually point out places like this where they're like, okay, this whole book is a giant chiasm. And what they'll do is they'll say like, all right, here's the first part. Here's how it ends. You see how they, they end at the same point. Okay, now, then they go to here. Like the second from the end of the book is here. Okay, now they go to here and here. And so you, you follow the progression. It's like boom, boom, boom. And then there's a reversal. Boom, boom, boom. And, and it's building this whole theme of like God can do this. God can bring you back where you started, or God can repair. And, and it, it's just kind of a neat process here. Um, and that's something just to kind of keep your eye out for. All right. Uh, I don't know why that was on a different click, but sure. All right. Now, Solomon is writing a biography. So that's kind of the other genre. You can read this stuff in your notes. So I'm going to move quickly through this. He is going to be talking about his building efforts, his wealth, his studies, etc. We've kind of already laid this out. That's, that's why I spent so much time talking about Solomon's history. Uh, but this is some of the stuff that he's going to be doing. It is not a complete biography. He does not mention his idolatry, which is why people sometimes are like, is this really written by Solomon? Uh, because there's certain things that are left out. But again, remember, if you are writing a story, if you're writing a book, you may not include every single detail. Okay? Imagine summarizing your whole life in about 12 chapters. Yet yeah, not going to happen. Okay? It's going to be rather general. It's going to be vague. You're going to use some illustrations of things that have happened, and you're like, well, I mean, yeah. Um, now, depending on how boring your life is, you might be able to get it in fewer chapters. Uh, but Solomon had a very busy, very wealthy, very ambitious life. Um, he could have done more. So just because it's not mentioned doesn't mean it didn't happen. It's just it was not applicable to what Ecclesiastes is trying to do. All right? And uh, so there it is. It's still a biography in kind of a general sense. Um, but there you go. It is also inspired scripture. Uh, so as we study Ecclesiastes, the Hebrews actually had a discussion on whether this book would soil the hands. And that was just kind of an expression of whether it was canon. Like, what, was it part of the inspired scripture? Uh, and the idea of, like, if you held actual scripture, like, you'd have to go wash your hands because, like, you're not worthy or something. I, I don't, don't quite understand the imagery. Maybe if you guys do, let me know. Um, but it's the idea that they would have an argument, is Ecclesiastes actually inspired scripture? Because there's things in it that you look at and you go, that doesn't seem to be in line with actual doctrine. Like, there's some things there that are like, I know what you're trying to say, but just if you take it out of context, that sounds really bad, and it does not sound like Scripture, all right? But we know it is, I mean, because it's been preserved and there's other reasons, but also, they actually would put it with all the other Scripture. So they treated it exactly like other Scripture, and uh, that's, that was their way of saying yes, we believe this is inspired. And so they, they did, uh, God's people, who were tasked with protecting the Old Testament, showed that they accepted this as scripture. So, um, so there was an argument, but again, Ecclesiastes is inspired scripture, but what it's doing is it's, it's, it's showing that there is an advantage to being a wise man in a fallen world. Now, it's not as much of an advantage in all ways that you would think, um, if anybody pays attention to politics or goes on Twitter at all. If you're a wise man, uh, not a wise guy, a wise man, uh, you, you don't succeed very well on that platform uh, because in a fallen world, people don't care. Um, but there are times where as a wise man you shine, but then your name is forgotten anyway. And so Solomon is kind of digging into this idea going, what's the point? Okay? And, and that's, that's where the whole under the sun concept is going to come into play. All right? Uh, the author wrestles with the sense of God's justice, similar to how Job is going to wrestle with it. And uh, again, there's some of that. Now, here are some of the main points that we want to understand as we go through Ecclesiastes. So we've covered all sorts of things. But the first thing, Solomon is going to start digging into this idea that he's going to say, you need to consider life, and I'm going to show you some contradictions to draw attention to what you need to know. Okay? There are things that bring pleasure, or things that look like they should bring pleasure, but they don't. In fact, they bring grief. 
Okay? So that's one of the main ones he spends a lot of time with. So if you have a Bible and you want to look at it, uh, look here. Uh, let's just take a look at Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Okay? Now in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, he's setting up kind of the parameters for his experiment, if you remember my illustration from the very beginning. And uh, he, he basically is just bringing up, there's a futility to things. There's an emptiness to things. That's that word vanity. And he says, the words of the preacher, the, king of, the son of David, king of Jerusalem. Again, that's why we think it's Solomon. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. So, so he just keeps repeating. That's, that's that, that repetition that we saw. Okay, What profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? And, and so he's like, what, what's the point? What profit is there in all of this? One generation passeth away, another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. So he's like, you, you, you live, you do all of your stuff, and you turn to dust and get washed away. What's the point? One, the sun ariseth, and the sun setteth, and hasteth to the place where he arose. So he's like, even the sun, for all the work it does, as it goes through the sky, just goes, whoop, and tomorrow starts all over again, and then, whoop, and tomorrow starts all over, and he's like, what's the, like, this is, this is stupid. Like, the, this repetitious cycle that just keeps... What's the point? Like, why? I mean, you, you can try to accomplish things, but they eventually wear away, and they're gone, and why am I doing this? Okay? He says, The wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about toward the north. It whirleth continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. Now, this is some cool science here, but please pay attention to the fact that he's not trying to make any scientific statements. Okay? Otherwise, you'd be going toward geocentricity because he says the sun rises and the sun sets and then returns to the place. We all understand it's the earth spinning. The whole point Solomon's trying to do is say every natural cycle we can observe basically just repeats over and over and over again. Everything just keeps resetting and starting over. He's not trying to make scientific statements here. Now, some of these things are straight up scientific statements because he would have studied, but he's not trying to be very precise. He's just saying... Pattern, 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 pattern. Okay? That's, that's the point he's trying to get at. He says this, All the rivers run into the sea, but the sea is not full. Under the place where the rivers come, thither they, they return again. So the water cycle. And, and again, he's just saying, it's this rep repetitive cycle. All things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear, ear filled with hearing. Okay? Now, I know this verse is used a whole lot in sermons, and people are like, Oh, guys, you got to watch out what you look at, because the eye is not satisfied with seeing. Okay, that, that's fine, but the point Solomon is trying to make, the reason he said that is not to protect you from looking at things you shouldn't. The point is, whether you're looking at things that are bad or good or whatever you're looking at, you always want to see it again. So, like, I, I don't know how many times Deb and I have gone to the Redwoods. It's not enough. I want to go see it again. And when I'm sitting there, like, minding my own business and just vegging out, I'm like, I want to be in the Redwoods. Like, it's just the place where I'm like, I could see a redwood every day and I'd still want to go see it again. Like, the eye is not satisfied with seeing. And that's the idea. Like, you can see the most beautiful thing ever. The moment you turn around and leave, you're going to be like, I just want to, I just want to see. You know, it's like when you go to the Grand Canyon. It's not like, oh, I saw it once. Cool. I'm, I'm happy now. I mean, I'm satisfied and life is good and never want to see the Grand Canyon... I mean, that's, uh, I think the only thing that we don't want to see again is things that are, like, grotesque. But then there are those people. Um, but, but that's the thing. Like, the eye is not satisfied with hearing. The ear is not satisfied with hearing. Like, how many times have you heard the same song over and over and over again, and you're like, I'm just kidding. I just kind of like the song. Okay? Now, there are certain songs I never want to hear again. Um, but that's not because I chose to listen to them. I just, you know, and, and, and that's the idea. Like, you will hear things and the ear is not going to be satisfied with hearing. The eye is not going to be satisfied with seeing. All right, and he says all things, uh, yeah, so th it just the idea of all things full of labor. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. That which is done is the thing that shall be done, and there's no new thing under the sun. So it's this idea of repetition. And so, like, you're, you're all like, you know, that thing faded away. Well, according to cycles, it's coming back. You know, until you think about, like, an eclipse or a comet or any of these things. It, it, it happened, and it cycles back around and happens again, and cycles back around and happens again. And the idea is, you just kind of feel pointless. You feel like you're part of an endless cycle that just keeps 
wearing away everything that you do. So you, you finish building, you leave it for about a year or two, and guess what happens to the building? And then you gotta build it again. And then it, and, and if you wanna keep the building up, you have to keep repairing it. And it just seems like an endless process. You're like, that rotted out again. And so you rip it all out, rebuild it, and guess what's gonna happen in a few months? Oh, that part rotted out. Okay, gotta go rebuild. And it, he's like, the life is just full of labor and vexation and frustration. You think like, we accomplished something great. We're done. I, that should satisfy. I'm good. But no, life is full of labor and you just keep coming back to the starting point again going, and I got to do it all over again. Okay. Any of you who've ever played a video game, you understand. It's like the new expansion comes out and every progress you've ever made is done and you have to start all over again. And you're like, you know, and every time they put out something new in the game, it erases everything you've done. And you're like, back on the treadmill. And that's, that's this idea. It's just endless work, endless frustration. And so you're like, this should satisfy. You know, you got that little like dopamine hit of like, yeah, I, I accomplished something. And then it wears off and you're like, guess I gotta go do it again. And that's the idea that Solomon's trying to push. He's like, if you're living for these things, you are going to be sorely disappointed. Okay. And so the things that we thought would bring pleasure don't, in fact, they bring grief. So those of us who worked on the mountain house back there, you know, you understand the frustration of like, ah, like I opened up the wall and there was rotten boards and I moved those rotten boards and there were more rotten boards and like, this was not supposed to be this hard. You know, you're like, I just thought we were putting siding up, but then I put my hand on the plywood and it dissolved. Like, that's not right. And that's this idea of these things that are like, okay, this is going to be easy. This, this will be fine. This will be simple. This will be satisfying. Turns out to be way more complicated than that. And so Solomon is really digging into the deep stuff to go like, what is the point of life? Why are we doing this? And that's why he keeps saying, if there is nothing above the sun, there's no point. Like, it, it's just like this idea of planning for the future or leaving stuff for your kids or grandkids. Like, what's the point? Let them suffer because, you know, it doesn't make your life any better. You're going to be dead anyway. Like, that, that's like... No, that, that, that's his mindset of like, if there is nothing above the sun, what's the point? I'm going to build all this wealth. I won't even get to spend it. And then I die and I give it to some wicked other person who is going to be like, yay, I didn't do anything for all this. And Solomon's like, all right. And so as we deal with this, there's accomplishments. They're going to leave you with nothing. They ultimately lead to you being forgotten. Kings rule but in their ruling, they actually end up hurting themselves. And you're like, well, the whole point of being a king, that's kind of a privileged position. You're not supposed to be hurting yourself. And he's like, but that happens, all right? Wisdom doesn't always protect the wise, yet sometimes it does. Like, and these are all frustrations. They're, they're apparent contradictions. There's things that you're looking at going, but Proverbs said, and he's like, I'm, I'm just showing you the, the depth to the Proverbs. And you're like, but you can't say that, Solomon. He's like, I wrote them. You know, and, and so Solomon's trying to explain the depth to the world. And he's trying to bring up the idea that God is working behind the scenes. Now, I'll, I'll pause here and I'm going to remind you of a term I gave you like the first week. And it's like this idea of happenstance, this idea of luck. Throughout the Bible, you're going to see this idea of luck. Does anyone remember what definition I gave to it? How does the Bible look at the, the topic of luck? Is God working behind the scenes? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and so the, the, the perfect example is, I, I keep bringing it up, but the book of Ruth. Okay? There's all sorts of things that just happen by happenstance. They just, I mean, we even use that word. Well, it just happened. Okay? The, the, the idea of luck or chance or, ooh, whoops. I mean, I love the end of Ruth. Uh, sorry. Uh, I'm going to leave Ruth for a moment and go to Esther. I'm going to leave Esther, uh, Ruth for a moment because in Esther, there's a whole bunch of that too. And they also have like the dice rolling that like picks the date that the thing is going to happen on. And you're like, oh, that is like the stereotypical thing of luck. You're like, okay, what date is it going to fall on? Well, I ain't that lucky. Like, and, and so between the books of Ruth and Esther, if you look at those, there are things happening all over the place, just hidden away. And you're like, well, that just, you know, Ruth just happened to go into Boaz's field. He just happened to be a kinsman. He just happened to be the second in line to marry her, and the first in line didn't want her. He just ha- 
Okay, it's not just happened. Okay, and then the book of Esther is even more in your face about it because what Esther does is it literally removes God from the story altogether. You don't see him mentioned at all. And there's all these things where it's like this guy just happened to hear this and he happened to do that and he happened to go here and the dice happened to roll and she happened to have... We, we understand it's not chance. It's God doing all sorts of stuff behind the scenes and that's what I think is really cool about Job because Job, like I said, peels back another layer and kind of shows us the, the electronics, so to speak. All right? It, it, it pulls the back off and goes, oh, that's what it looks like. That's what's going on. And so if, if we could see Esther, like we saw Job, like, could you imagine if Job was written without all the God dialogue stuff? So, like, we didn't know what was going on. We would read the book of Job and be like, whoa, this is insane. Like, what is going on? Like, this guy's just... He must be a really bad dude. or Like, we would start acting like Job's friends. But we are given kind of the cheat sheet at the very beginning to know what's going on. But there are times in the book of Esther where we're like, what is going on? But it's all the stuff going on behind the scenes. Okay? So that's this idea. Wisdom doesn't always protect, but there's a level of sovereignty. Now, foolishness sometimes receives the benefit of the wise. And again, it's that frustration where... Foolishness should lead to trouble, but it doesn't. Wisdom should lead to profit and pleasure, but it doesn't always. Okay? And that's the idea Solomon's also trying to play is, it may look like a contradiction right now, but bear with it, because it will play out in the end. Like, the end result will work. That's why you have to have faith that there's something above the sun. Okay? Does that all make sense? Like, as all these pieces of Ecclesiastes weave together... Okay, so if someone is misinterpreting Ecclesiastes, it's probably because they're missing some of these points. They're missing some of the apparent contradictions. They're missing how the different threads of the book weave together. There's basically, if you want to imagine it, Ecclesiastes is, is this big river like flowing along behind the scenes, and every now and then there's like this little like mud pool that gets stirred up. And so like you see this muddy at the top of the water, and you're like, what is that? And I think a lot of people, when they misinterpret Ecclesiastes, is they're focusing in on the little mud. And you're like, well, the, this is a dirty river. Like, I, I can't believe this. This is crazy. And it's like, hold on. Take a step back. Look at the whole picture. And then when you see the little mud ball, like, plop into the surface, it'll make sense because you know what he's doing underneath. Like, there's this, oh, okay, there's a current there that's intentionally drawing this to the surface so you can see it. Okay, I, I get what you're doing. But a lot of people who, who, admittedly, they're not Christians. They're just dealing with this like literature. A lot of people are just going to say, let's ignore pretty much everything else the Bible says. And we'll focus in on these weird little quirks. And, and that's what doesn't, it just doesn't make sense to them. And so, so that's, that's how this unpacks. Okay? Uh, wise men are sometimes forgotten. Again, that's a frustration there. Um, Solomon is also, uh, as he does this, he's going to attempt to use these contradictions to prod people or goad them back to their roots. This, again, is where we started way back, like, four weeks ago. But, again, what you need to do is you need to combine your reflection with God's revelation. Okay? So as you think about what you're observing, as you process it, you need to keep coming back to what God has said. Okay? Now, I, I want to I pause, and I want to say that again. You need to combine your reflection with God's revelation. So no matter what it is in your life, no matter where you are, even if you're not studying Ecclesiastes, your thoughts, to quote Darren, you have stinking thinking, all right? That's, that's this idea. Your thoughts are bad, okay? They're tainted by sin. They're completely, I'm not saying they're as bad as they can be, but they are corrupt. And so if you give into the despair, the d depression, the frustration, the whatever, whatever that thought is, okay, well, then you're going to start this downward spiral. But what you need to do is you take your thoughts like, this doesn't make sense. This looks like a contradiction. This doesn't seem right. And then you tie it in with what God has said, God's revelation, and this will produce a dependency on God. Okay? This is, this is where we're going to end this week, but I do want to recommend, um, when I was doing study for this course, I, I, I was watching through, uh, Jim Berg has a whole series. Um, I might have it next thing. No. Well, I mean, he, he references this, but, yeah, I, no, I don't, I, maybe that's the title of the whole thing, but he, anyway, maybe I'll have it on a future uh, thing, but he has a whole study through the book of Ecclesiastes, 
and, and he keeps focusing on the goads, and what he, what he talks about is this downward spiral, okay? So like I said, this is where we're gonna end, but I wanna show you this downward spiral. Um, basically it's this, like the failures of men lead us to reflect. The emptiness that comes from something should be pleasurable. Life is brief, life is boring. Great amount of energy are used up in things that just repeat themselves. And so what Jim Berg does in his, his study is he says, these are the goads, these are the prods that keep coming up in Ecclesiastes that are trying to push you to the point of saying, am I gonna depend on God or am I gonna despair? Where, where am I gonna go? So, so you think like Job, Job was prodded and prodded and prodded and he could have said, I give up. And he could have just despaired. But he chose to depend on God over and over and over again. And it was a constant decision he had to make. So he chose to depend on God. There were more goads. He could despair or he could depend. And he chose to depend. Goes through more goads, despair or depend. Which one are you going to choose? And so it's this constant process. And so these are some of the goads that are going to kind of push us off of our comfort zone. Because if you're not paying attention, you might not know these things, and you might go, life is good. But once you start noticing like the dirty underbelly of the world, you go, um, how does that work? And again, it either leads you to despair, or it leads you to depend. And, and, and this is a process we'll dig into um, over the coming weeks. Um, but I just want you to pay attention to this, because again, you have to take your thoughts and line them up with what God has said. Otherwise, you, you just spiral downward. And Okay, uh, I'll leave you with one other book. Uh, it is, uh, Dr. James White has written a book on, on grieving. And it's this, it's a book called Grieving. Um, and, and so, uh, I know, creative name. Um, but, but in this book, he, he deals with this idea of the different emotions you experience after someone close to you has died. And he deals with this idea of if you don't respond properly to these, you begin the downward spiral. And if you respond properly as the different stimuli hit you, you, you basically start the upward spiral. And so he, it, it's, again, it's that same idea of if you start depending on God and trusting in him in this hard time, then you spiral upward, so to speak. But if you start giving in, well, then you spiral downward. And that, that's very simplistic of it, but um, he, he does a much better job of explaining it than I did. But these are all these concepts that Solomon is building in, in Ecclesiastes.